I'm excited to um, introduce uh, our next session. We um, are delighted to have um, Alan Knaber with us today. Uh, Alan uh, is uh, based in also um, close to Helsinki. Uh, he uh, uh, runs an organization, API Able, API Able and uh, he's going to um, talk with us this afternoon about perhaps some of the, the, the branding questions we might have around uh, developer portals, how we have an opportunity perhaps to think of them differently. Um, welcome, Alan. Can you... Uh, Hello, Claire. Hi. Can hear you well. That's great. Looking good. Very good. Very good. Yeah. So um, uh, excited to have you to join. Um, probably ask you just to get your slides up and running and we'll um, okay. make sure that's all going well. Okay. Let's do that now. So here they are. Can you see them okay? I can certainly see them fine. That's great. Perfect. So I'll kick off then. Join you shortly. Thank you. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about uh, why your API portal is so bad. But if we're being honest, it's about why your API portal sucks. This is the second version of the uh, presentation. So if you saw the one earlier in May, there's, there's quite some changes here to keep you interested. So a little bit of an introduction to myself. I'm Alan Kanabe. Um, I call myself an API product manager, also co-founder of APIable.io. Um, my other co-founder is uh, Lorenzo in, uh, in Italy, uh, and we work on um, API type topics and integration topics, specifically API products and, of course, uh, API portals, which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. So um, I've got over 20 years experience now in a wide range of uh, different verticals from you know, uh, high tech, uh, pharma, banking, uh, manufacturing. So I, I, I've been around quite a lot and it's given me a good opportunity to see a different perspective on a lot of different organizations, which uh, I, I hopefully bring into, into my work. Before we begin to talk about um, API portals, I wanted to share with you um, a story about what happened to me last year. And it's one of the reasons why I started API Able. Um, I was having a, a drink with a, a chief digital officer uh, in a large bank, actually. Um, and we were chatting away about different things. And then inevitably, I started to talk about APIs, right? About how APIs are going to save mankind, uh, which they probably will do at some point. Um, and then at some point he interjected and said, look, Alan, you know, I've heard this a thousand times before. APIs, yeah, they're great. But bottom line is I haven't yet seen any real value represented uh, from my API program. So he's basically saying he's pumped one, two, three million, uh, however much uh, from the C-suite has gone into the API program. Um, but they're not seeing the value. So that even means that, you know, the value isn't coming from the API program or, or it's not. Um, represented properly from the API program. So it's it, it's given me a, a, some time to, to think about that. And, and that's why I started APIable, was to really uh, get into the uh, reasons why uh, API programs either aren't presenting themselves properly or why they're not um, providing value as they should be. So if we look at it, there's basically two different cases, right? So you've got digital transformation on the one hand, which you could argue is more of an internal focus. On the other side, you've got um, new revenue streams, which is more of an external focus. So um, it might be that your organization is focusing more on one, more an internal focus, or if you're a line of business, maybe it's more external focus. But effectively, this is this is what we've we've promised to do. And well, the challenge has been accepted, right? So so the mission of APIable is to prove that guy wrong. Okay. I can't really put that on a website. No one would understand it. So I had to change it to empower API-led organizations to realize their true potential, right? And uh, that's what we mean, right? So so all these API programs are around. You probably have one in, in your company as well um, to help them get to a point where they're providing really good value for the organization. And it's clearly um, seen throughout the organization. And the strategy is pretty clear. We're going to focus on API products. Um, that is, you know, getting APIs, productizing them, and put them out to a customer um, who needs the product. And then, of course, API portals, which is um, a portal where you can demonstrate those API products. 
So let's kick this off then. Now, why does your developer portal suck? Well, let's play a little game of um, zombie portals, right? So uh, I put a, a post out recently on LinkedIn, and a lot of people commented that you know the zombie portal is something that they've seen themselves. So how you play this game is that uh, don't do this now, do this later. Uh, you prepend developer dot uh, to your, your domain, right? So if you work for, I don't know, Coca-Cola or McDonald's or BMW or Volvo, whatever it is, right? You put developer dot and then you go ahead and, and have a look at that portal, right? So what you normally find is when you go to these portals is that the design doesn't match the corporate branding, right? The logo is probably a little bit off, a bit too small, too big. There's not enough space around it. The colors are maybe not 100% accurate. It doesn't really match the, the corporate guidelines, right? Uh, I was at a um, workshop earlier in the year, and I sat next to a nice lady from um, marketing and communications. And I, I said to her, hey, did you know your organization has a developer portal? And after explaining what a developer portal was, we, uh, we took a look at it. You know, and I can still hear the screams echoing in my ears today. Um, she was not happy, and some heads may have rolled, and I apologize if that was you. Um, but yeah, the design is not always up to scratch. Back in the day, we used to um, produce really technical um, APIs, get like a, a swagger file, throw it up on the internet, and say, OK, developers, here it is. Um, if you're still seeing websites that do that, it's probably a sign that it's a zombie. Difficult to get started. Um, yeah, so, so even if you can sign up for the API, it could be that you have to wait a few weeks before you actually get access to it, for instance. Or you can't really see very easily and clearly what you're supposed to do. And my favorite is when you, know, you see the last black, uh, blog post. It's like 2017 or 2016. So uh, you see you know, a lot of entries in 2015. It's new, fresh, this, this fantastic API program where you're running hackathons with developers and getting developers interested in your portal. Uh, and then slowly the interest fades, right? And the interest fades mainly because the developers didn't come, right? So let, let's move on then and ask a question, okay, at this point, well, do you need one anyway, right? So if you have an API program and you've had a zombie portal for the last five years and no one has really noticed, well, I mean, do you need one? Um, so I had a conversation last week with uh, my old boss, Sasha, um, from Swisscom, and, and, and I you know, basically asked him this question. He says, it's absolutely necessary to have an API portal. I mean, Swisscom has one of the most successful API programs in the whole of Europe. Um, we won a prize for it. We went to California. It was great. We got a trophy and everything. So it, 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 you know, it got a lot of recognition. And, and basically, Sasha is saying that if you don't have one, you can't be as successful. So uh, the, the, the chief digital officer at C-suite um, are not going to be happy with you if you're not producing uh, that kind of value. And it's really, uh, it's really a touch point with your customers as well. So especially when you go down like the API product route, it's the first place that a customer will come in contact with the API product is on your API portal or marketplace. Um, and you really want to do a good job at that point. If, if the quality looks kind of low, if it doesn't look like you've put any effort into it, the customer might not have confidence in the product to proceed, right? They want to know that, you know, this is looked after, it's cared for, and it's going to be around in five years' time, i.e. it's not going to turn into a zombie portal. So let's step through some of the things you can do about it, right? So the first things uh, that, that you need to think about is know thy customer. And, and, and this is, you know, a part of this, this track is talking about, okay, well, you know, who is your customer? So regardless of if you're selling popsicles or uh, API, API op cycles, um, it doesn't matter. You need to still understand, okay, who your customer is. And in our case, okay, it's uh, well, developers, right? You know, developers, developers, developers. So developer portals, developer experience, swagger, et cetera. You know, that's what we've been doing um, over the last eight years or so, developer portals, right? But if we stop a second and look at a definition of what a customer is, right? So we're producing products nowadays. What is a customer? The customer is the person who pays for the product. They're the decision maker behind the choice whether or not the product is going to be used, right? The user is not the decision maker. The user is still very important. You want to have a good user experience, but it's the it's a decision maker who we build our products for. And in this case, surprise, surprise, the developer is probably not your target customer. So unless you're, for example, Twilio, and you're creating products tailored for developers, which is something completely different, 
if you're an organization, uh, I don't know, making paper, for instance, probably your customer is uh, one of your existing customers today. And that's what we see, right? Um, the customer is probably the one you already know. So if you're in a telecommunications business, it's like, you know, your enterprise customers, et cetera, right? It's the customer you know today. Um, in an internal case, the customer, uh, again, it might not be a developer or a technical user. It might be someone who's a little bit more business focused, maybe a business analyst, and you want to provide the value to that um, person um, without throwing up technical details. And one of the ways we do this is we say, okay, um, have different roles within the, the, the API portal, right? So you're still going to cater for a developer. De developers don't really care that much about you know, your marketing material and your videos, et cetera. They want to get like their API credentials. Um, they want to see some examples. They want to try out the API, see the documentation, that kind of thing. You know, the whole thing that the, um, the whole DX experience, um, it's still fundamentally valid. But on the business side, it's the exact opposite, right? So again, it's a decision maker buying the product doesn't want to come to a site and be bombarded with technical details. They want to be able to extract the value from it, you know, maybe punch in a credit card if it's necessary or, or choose what, how they want to pay for that thing. Moving on then, so let's, we, we, we've spoken quite a bit about uh, productization, right? Um, and API is a product. So if you've been living under a rock for the last five years or so, you won't have heard this term API as a product, but for everybody else, you've heard it. But it, I don't know if it's been really that well understood, right? One of the things we're trying to say with this is, sure, it's about you know putting a fancy picture on with some marketing text and possibly monetization. But the real value for me is, is that you can put the value proposition um, into the product. So e each one of these API products has a value proposition. Uh, and that's something that we didn't have before. So there's no point having the best API pool in the world if you've nothing to put on it. So you can go around the internet and you can like find some of the best developer portals in the world. They look fantastic. The design is, is, is excellent. But you look at the actual products underneath and you're a bit meh, meh. They, they, they don't really you know, offer any value. They don't really have a target customer in mind, right? Again, I've spoken a little bit about you know internal customers as well. Um, creating products for um, internal customers is also important, right? Again, it's about providing internal services uh, with a value proposition. And also, compared to a to a project, product is a much vehicle to get to where you want to be, right? You want to deliver value to to external or internals. It doesn't matter. Um, a product is something that, that continues and you incrementally make it better over time. A project is a short-lived thing which achieves an aim and then disappears. So you can imagine if your company has, for example, a mobile application. If you're running it as a project, um, it'll probably go live, let's say, one year late um, and won't provide that, uh, that much value. It will maybe work. And then everyone will kind of disappear and do different things. And then you'll just have a bad... Uh, a bad product, right? That no one really um, wants to work with. It's also important to speak to customers. I know a lot of people, you know, are from a technical background, and they're used to, you know, getting requirements, putting out code, uh, maybe there's some bug fixing, and they don't come near the customer. And that's something that that has to change, right? If you're going to create API products that people actually want, you have to understand them, understand their problems, and and be speaking to customers. So I'll just quickly step through this. It's a bit technical, but I got asked recently by someone who said, okay, I have 150 APIs. How do I productize them? Where do I begin, right? So when we look at this, we can say, okay, a lot of API programs start and they say, we want to be transformational. We want to be the next Elon Musk. We want to create products that really uh, disrupt the, um, the industry. And I would advise you not to do that because it's really tricky, right? The, the whole startup thing, you know, a lot of them fail for a reason. Um, it's because it's difficult. It's really difficult to, to do that. You can do that later once you've got some quick wins on the about. Also on the opposite side here, if your company has a core product offering, again, let, let's say, I, I know telecommunications, um, you're, you're selling contracts to maybe enterprise customers, for example, you, you have those existing customers. But you don't want to be operating in that space because you'll find yourself in project management meetings, 
right? You know, 60% of your time. And that is something you want to avoid at all costs, right? You do not want to be in project management meetings. So the sweet spot is really, you know, somewhere around here in this, this adjacent, quite close to the core. So you're, you're not going crazy. You're still going to offer products to the same um, customers, right? Uh, it's existing business, but it, it's maybe like new to the company. Right, so the way you do this is that you speak to your customers, you find out what pain points they have using your existing products, and you think of ways you can digitize that to make that pain go away. And then, then you stand a chance of creating products that your customers actually want. Uh, I think the third point here is to reduce friction. Um, I mean, for me, when I, when I look at these dev portals, the, the question that I'm always left asking is, you know, what's your call to action? So um, a lot of this conversion optimization and growth hacking, that kind of stuff is about, you know, really small things on a website, you know, moving the button slightly and changing the color of the button uh, and really optimizing it to say, okay, what does this, what do we want the customer to do on this page? Do, do they want to buy something, take out a subscription? Do I sign up for a marketing email, et cetera? And, that, uh, and that's, the, um, that's, that's the essence of the page and what you want your customer to do. When I look at some of these dev portals, it's not clear to me what the call to action is, what you want the customer to, to actually do on the page. Uh, and if your call to action is that they have to pick up a phone and call someone or, or write an email, yeah, your, your conversion is probably going to be like 0.0% .0 there, right? So that, that's one of the things that we need to look at. Also, you know, when you when you do sign up for an API, um, it can take days or weeks to get access to it, right? We, we do have these approval processes in place, and um, it, it can take a long time. Um, and I think we used to be able to get away with that. But, you know, as an example, nowadays, if I say to my kids, um, hey, guys, um, it used to take me, say, one week before my television program would come off. I, if I was waiting for, like, the next episode of Red Dwarf, right, I'd watch one. And then next week, same time, I'd watch another one. If I explain that to my kids nowadays, they look at me like I'm crazy, right? They do not understand it. They're like, don't be silly, Daddy. Just go to Netflix. It's all there. You just press a button, and, it, and then you're up and running. And, and that's the world we live in, right? You can't get away anymore with this... Uh, you know, slow response. The customer wants to be pressing buttons and things are happening in the background, right? So when we look at this friction topic, it's good to map out your, your current journey that you have with your customer and users, right? Identify these, like how many manual processes you have in place uh, and really try and find these friction points and start to, to take away as many as you can if you have some products and you're going to go live with them, make certain that you have like all of these organizational politics ironed out, especially in larger enterprises. You don't want to have a customer uh, and then have to, you know, run around the organization creating service requests and begging people to get access to certain things. You want all that ironed out. Um, security, I'll talk about this in the next section as well, but you want to bake that in at the product level. Uh, from this, I mean, you don't want to have to talk to security for every new customer you're on board, right? That would take too much time. You want to get the security approval at the product level and say the product is secure, and then you can go ahead and use it without having to have a conversation each time. Eating your own, own dog food, using your own API. So when a customer logs into the portal, you can identify them, you know who they are, and you can retrieve their uh, assets and then work against those assets. And yeah, sure, we want to have everything automated, like I, I just said. Um, but you got to start where you can, right? Uh, and build into it incrementally. Um, you get 10 points if you know who the character in the background is. Uh, you can put that in the chat. I'll award the points later. Um, but get secure, right? This is this is really important, right? And you're still scared by GDPR. You know, you know we all are, right? Uh, you don't want to be the person who costs your company like you know was it five percent of your revenue for last year or something right you wouldn't be able to walk around the office you wouldn't be walking around the office very much longer so we're all scared by gdpr right um but again it comes back to a conversation i had with sasha last week as well i say okay well where did you go in the last two years since i've been gone they said one of the one of the real wins they had there was that they started to see security compliance uh and gdpr as as um, an opportunity, not a threat. So it's a major headache in a lot of organizations. 
And so the API program there at Swisscom said, okay, well, let, let's um, take care of compliance with code. So, so they write software um, that lets you categorize um, APIs uh, and the data coming. So if a system of record has a pain that it knows it needs to get the information out there, but it, it's a little bit scared about how it would do that. Um, you got a team who say, well, it's no problem. We take care of it. It's a bit like Mikhail was saying in the previous discussion as well that, you know, um, they see themselves as like, you know, SaaS helping the organization as well. So there's, there's a definite opportunity there um, for you. Um, you have to work with your security team. Again, bake security into your products. You want to have it, you want to you have a situation where your security team trusts you that you've got it all in the control. And most importantly, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, I, I've been in a lot of situations where we spent weeks or months talking about security and, and you know, how everything will work in the background. And simple answer is that it has already been done. Um, OAuth 2 is, is, is like a standard. JSON web tokens are, are really coming through now, providing a lot of value. Curity, um, if you've not come across Curity before, they're a team across in Stockholm. Um, I, I've had a look through their products and they're, they're quite amazing. Uh, if you have any authorization, um, authentication type requirements, um, I can guarantee you that Curity can solve that, right? So just, just speak to those guys before you spend six months thinking about this. Um, so this is the conclusion then, you know, know thy customer, productize, reduce friction, and get secure. So if you're doing this, you should be able to produce an API portal um, that is good, right? On that note, if you need help, uh, API-able offers consulting services. So if you think you have a zombie portal and you want to find out, okay, can we do anything about it, then we'll review it and we'll give you an idea, okay, um, what you can do. Uh, also, if you're looking to build APIs as a product but don't really know where to start, you can talk to us. We've got a lot of experience in that as well. Um, on the side, of course, we're producing an API portal. We're letting it as the next gen API portal made with uh, modern standards. We have a prototype available, and you can see a demo. There's a small uh, uh, screenshot of the demo there in the corner. It's technology agnostic. We built a demo on Kong. Um, it has like, you know, marketplace as you expect, the roles, um, IDP integration, content management system, et cetera. So just get in touch if that interests you, but don't dilly dally because we are talking to some customers now. If you really think this is something for you, then get in touch as soon as possible. So we got some time. Also on the side, we have a data integration platform, which is open source um, based on the IntelliJ plugin and it lets you design and uh, create run integration flows, right? Uh, which is really, really nice. It's already available. Just go ahead and use it. It's open source. Why not? It's a bit like uh, MuleSoft, but better. I'm guessing I'm out of time. Or... Um, no, Alan, we've um, uh, we've probably got like uh, two or three minutes to uh, oh, wow. take a question um, or two. Uh, okay. um, we actually don't have questions. We've got some comments on uh, uh, your beard and uh, <laughs> um, so on in the, in the chat. Um, nice. But no, I, thank you for um, that really uh, fantastic presentation. I I love the pragmatism and uh, common sense that you have applied. It, 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 very rich content. Yeah. We've gone from uh, um, the, the, the 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 Walking Dead portals um, <laughs> that uh, we want to avoid. Um, yes. The uh, the pragmatism of um, uh, what what actually to try and go after? You know, be, trying to be truly transformational um, and not being uh, you know too um, pedestrian in in yep. the choice. Um, this idea of uh, adjacency, finding a sweet spot that's appropriate for the business, creating the frictionless um, uh, built-in top to bottom product yep. capability, really really yep. really key. I, I guess um, you, you gave people a bit of a call to action at the end, but I, I think as a as a question, what do you think are some of the things that people would look at first if they've if if they're sort of through part the way through maturity, but they've got a lot of different levels of um, experience. What are the things that you do to kind of harness the most important thing to be doing next? Okay, I'd, I'd say you know if if I was to look at it, especially since a lot of organisations do have developer pools out there, um, they're maybe not great, but I would look first at the API products. Um, you know, it's a chicken and egg thing going on. You do need somewhere you can you know showcase them so that people want them. Uh, that is one thing, but um, 
yeah. like I said Sorry. before, there are some portals which are um, there are some portals which are beautiful, but they have like no content, right? Uh, no, no API product. So I'd start there first and say, okay, what do you have to bring to the table, right? Get that nailed, and then say, okay, well, how how we can actually you know implement that? Can I just ask you to stop sharing your screen as well while you're there? Great, thank you, yeah. thank you, Alan. that's good. Um, <laughs> No, that's um, that's really fantastic, and um, I think you're going to be staying around and joining us for uh, Q and A um, uh, with Mikel uh, in another 25 minutes after the next talk. Yes. So um, I'm hoping very much that everybody who's out there listening and and uh, um, has, has can be thinking about some good questions for Alan because um, we'll be really interested to to um, share some experiences. Um, yeah, yeah, some really hard questions as well. That we can yeah, get from Mikel. Yeah. Difficult questions. Um, because um, I'm sure from what we just heard, we'll get a very uh, practical and pragmatic and experienced response. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.